was asking me about some app. I said, I don't know. I don't use that one. He said, oh, maybe it was Mr. Raymond. I said, yeah, that sounds like him. Oh, okay. He said he had four hours of Mr. Raymond yesterday and four and a half hours of me. So he had a pretty full day. So anyway. All right. Uh, we are recording. Uh, because a couple of you are not here, three of you are not here, and I just want to make sure you would hear these announcements. Um, I guess first and foremost, my office hours have changed just slightly. Monday, Wednesday office hours are just the same, but second mini term, my second mini term social science starts later than my first mini term did. So on Tuesdays and Thursdays, my office hours used to be 10:45 till 12:30. Now they're 10:45 to 11, uh, 1:15. So a little bit longer, 45 minutes longer on Tuesday and Thursday for office hours. And then, of course, I go 45 minutes later into the evening. Uh, so 5.45, I'll leave around 6. So anyway, just wanted to let you know that. Okay. Any, uh, oh, if any of you are graduating this term and were not able to attend one of the three graduation meetings that they had scheduled, uh, the one on Bessemer campus was yesterday. The last one is today at 1.30. So it's going to be starting pretty soon, about an hour, uh, on the Birmingham West Campus, the ACAT uh, building, first floor theater. Uh, and uh, if you were not able to attend those and will be going through the graduation exercises, you can go to the Lawson State homepage and then at the top of the page, you'll see a bunch of blue tabs. Somewhere near the right-hand corner of the top, you'll see one big, bright gold tab that says Quick Links. If you check on that Quick Links, click on the cl click on the Quick Links, then scroll down until you find graduation information. And I think everything, well, there's a bunch of stuff there, most of what you would have heard at the meeting, Plus, I think Dr. Uh, Ms. Chisholm said she might be sending a few other things out there on it. So be checking that periodically and go through it carefully, and hopefully you'll get everything that you would have gotten at the meeting. Better to be at the meeting where you can ask questions, but if you're not, that's second best. All right. Now, for class, any questions before we get started today? Anything? No. Okay. Before we actually get started... Today, we're going to be start working on uh, Chapter 12, Section 4, uh, but the uh, we were going to do the preliminary questions from 12.3. Uh, I'm going to start here, I think, because this is a uh, probably a little bit more white space here to do the preliminary questions on page 650. 12.3. Is the dot product of two vectors a scalar or a vector? A scalar, absolutely. Number two, what can you say about the angle between A and B if A dot B is less than zero? We have two vectors A, vector B, B give them the same terminal point, uh, our, our initial point, the surface here. Uh, and what can you say about the angle between A and B if the dot product A and B is less than zero? Obtuse angle is an obtuse angle. If, if the dot product was greater than zero, it would be an acute angle. Okay, number three, which, because they depend on the cosine and cosine of an acute angle is positive, obtuse angle is negative. Okay. Number three, which property of dot products allows us to conclude that if vector V is orthogonal to both U and W, then V is orthogonal to U plus W? Which product of vector, which property of vector of dot products, I can't call, okay, enables you to Conclude that, that if 
you had a vector v orthogonal to both u and w, then vector v is orthogonal to u plus w. <clears throat> And they're asking for which property of dot products. I think they want you to go back to 645 theorem 1 where they list those. And they said which property of dot products allows us to conclude, I think I'll write this down because it's going to be hard just to say, uh, that if, yeah, I'm going to get my pen colored properly, V, okay. Say, oh, okay. Okay, say something, okay? No, no I, I didn't realize it was still off, sorry. Okay, vector V, if I could find my pen here. Vector V is orthogonal to, that's just I'm all tied up in my cord here, is orthogonal to both U and W. Okay, orthogonal to both of those. Absolutely. Okay. If you look at that distributive law number, the, the, the number four distributive law on page 654, the second, well, it doesn't matter which convection you have. Uh, they just have the, the letters wrong, but let's do the first one there. Only let's make that V dot u plus w is equal to v dot u plus v dot w. It's basically one of the distributed laws of vector of dot multiplication over vector addition. The only thing is I flip this over. Okay? And if you flip it over and you see v dot u, if those are perpendicular, that's going to be zero. And v dot w, since those are perpendicular, or orthogonal, that's going to be zero. Zero plus zero is zero. That means v dot u plus w has to be, so that indicates v is orthogonal to the sum of u and w. All right. Now, and that, that's exactly what they were looking for. The other thing, and this is a little more abstract perhaps, but it sort of makes physical sense to me. You have vector u and vector v. Uh, um, vector u and vector w. And v is perpendicular to both of those. That means they, those two are in a plane that's perpendicular to v, right? Well, if u and v are in the same plane, the sum of u and v is in the same plane as well. So therefore, that has to be the same. That to me is a uh, sort of a visual, in some sense, abstract visual way of looking at it as well. And it says the same thing that does. That's just maybe a little more formal. Okay. Number four. Which is the projection of v projection of V along V. Am I reading that right? I guess so. What is the projection of V along V? Is it V? That's the A answer. Or is it B, which is E to V? Now what does E stand for? The unit vector of the direction of V. So what's the projection of V along V? Is it A, V? Or is V the unit vector along V? V.
again, physically think of what is the projection of vector v on itself. It's itself, right? So that's got to be a. If it's not a, I'm sorely disappointed. Okay. And here we have Marcus. Three out of four. Hopefully the fourth will come in. Okay. I forgot to be looking at the answers back here. We were just answering along. We're at 12, 3, preliminary. It's a scalar. It's obtuse. It's a distributed wall. We did that one. And this certainly is a. Okay. All right. Number five. Let U parallel to V, the projection of U, okay. the component of U parallel to V. That's the best way to say that. V, the projection of U along V. And this is, is the projection of U along V. Okay, that is what it is. Okay. Which of the following, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> which of the following is the projection of U along the vector to V? U. What we're looking for is the projection of U along to V, or not to V. Okay. And which is the projection of 2U along V? Projection of 2U along V. Okay. Now, they give you two questions and three possible answers. Okay, A is one half U project the parallel component of U along V. B is project is parallel component of U along V, and C is two times the projection of. Uh, Parallel component of U along V. All right. Two questions, three answers, match them up. Here's what's given. U is the side of V. The parallel component of U along V is defined to be the projection of U along V. That's what we're given. Okay? And that is true. So, the first question is, what is the projection of U along 2V? Or not 2V? Say again, A. Yeah. Wait, wait, did you say A? Okay, fine. Yeah. I don't think so. We'll go back and check. But let's think of it this way. Here's U, right? And here's V down here. Projection of U along V would be somewhere along like this. Okay, I think I've got my arms about right. Now, if you double V, it just gets twice as long. The projection of U along that is still the same as it was before. It hasn't changed. Okay? Even if he was a little short vector here, the projection of U along the, that would be that. And you double this, and it's still that. Okay? So, yeah. This is B. How about the projection of 2U along V? What would that be? That would be C. It's twice the projection of U along V. Okay? I sure hope that's right. B and then C. Let's see what C, what the, yeah, B and then C. Very good. Alright, and then number 6. Do I have Room. Which of the following, let's just go and clean the page. Probably should have done it earlier. We're just running out of room here. Which of the following is equal to cosine theta? Okay. Which of these is equal to cosine theta, where theta is the angle between u and v? So this is u, and this is v, 
and this theta is this angle here. So what is cosine theta? Now, <clears throat> the A, quest, A answer is U dot B. The B answer is U dot EV. And the C answer is EU dot EV. Ah, which of those is cosine theta? First, is it u dot b? So u dot b is magnitude of u times magnitude of b times cosine theta. That would only be true if u and b were both unit vectors, which it doesn't say they are. Okay? I don't think that quite answers it, unless they happen to both be universal. Okay, how about B? Uh, U, I think I just gave it away there, didn't I? Okay, let's call that C, what I just said, or C. It's a unit vector along U, whether you were short or long, whatever, that would be that, and that would be that. So the unit vector along B would be that. And then the dot product of those two would be the magnitude of this plus the magnitude of that. But these are both unit vectors, so that we want to have one times the cosine theta. So sorry, gave it away from you. So that would indeed be C. Doesn't look like it should be, but it, that's exactly what it is. And in the back, they even agree that's C. All right, I think I already made the assignments for 2-3 last time, didn't I? Right? Okay. So, let's move on. So, I don't remember looking at all those. Wow. I guess I wasn't paying close attention. But 76 isn't one you had to do, but 77 is a pretty interesting problem. Uh, Three-dimensional space that you know, I think it's pretty good. But anyway... I hope, did I make those assignments? I usually do, but did I last time? It may be we ran out of time and I didn't, did I? Well, I'll do them again just in case. Any of the odds 1 through 11? Any of the odds 11, uh, 13 through 17? Do either 19 or 21 or both? Any of the odds 23 to 27? Any of the odds 29 through 33? Either 35 or 37, or both. Either 39 or 41, or both. Any of the odds 43 through 51. Any of the odds 53 through 59. Do 61. Do 63. Do any of the odds 65 to 69? Do 71. Do either 73 or 75, or both if you choose. And then 77, that's, I, that's why I don't think I did it. I would have found that an interesting problem to stop and mention, and it's an interesting problem, so I won't do any more on that. But 77... Uh, or any of the odds, say, 77 through 89, okay? And further insights and challenges, if you're really interested, you can pursue those. Um, I just looked at those to see if, oh, here's something. Uh, number 91. Uh, you don't have to do it, but it refers to the cauchy Schwartz inequality, Okay? Now, one reason I stopped and mentioned that, or three reasons, okay, is that there's three, two names, Cauchy and Schwartz. You can write on either of those people, or how they collaborated, whether they did it uh, at the same time, or did it over 
decades or centuries apart from each other. Uh, how they came up with this inequality or how it's used, okay? So there's three or four different paper topics that you could find in that. So that's why I usually look at the uh, further insights and challenges, not that I necessarily think you ought to spend a lot of time on those, but if you're interested, you certainly could. So now we're ready to start uh, 2.4, which is a cross product. Another way to multiply vectors. One way is a dot product. Sometimes an old thing they call it the scalar product, but they don't use that terminology because it's confusing with scalar product with scalar times a vector. That's also called a scalar product. But a dot product produces a scalar answer, as the first question says. And you multiply two vectors and you get a scalar. Now, here is a picture with, I think, a little bit of added stuff in it of uh, the spiral paths of charged particles in a bubble chamber in the presence of a magnetic field. And that activity is described using cross products. Now, what I question, and it may actually be they make paths that look like this, Looks like to me someone connected dots, you know, but maybe this really are the paths and you can see them this clear. Obviously, they've done something with colors to enhance it, um, so it's pretty fascinating to look at, okay? Um, and I think it's actually in reality what you see, okay? With the color enhancement. Dot products are used to express some of that motion. Now, one of the problems here is that with dot products, you're almost always dealing with three dimensions. I mean, cross products. You're almost always dealing with three dimensions. Whereas dot product, by their definition, multiplying two vectors, anytime you've got two vectors, they're in a plane. Okay? And then you multiply them, you get a scalar, which doesn't even need to be in space at all. Okay? So basically, that's kind of a planar type geometry. The cross products basically have to have three dimensions. Now, how they've taken out one dimension here is that it says in the presence of the magnetic field, if you put the magnetic field perpendicular to this, then all the action is happening in this plane. So you probably are seeing pretty close to a plane. That, that is a good description. If you don't have that, then you're seeing three-dimensional motion on a two-dimensional plane, which is hard to see. But if you put the a magnetic field perpendicular to that, you would be perfectly fine. All right, so what is a cross product? Now, here is a, another. These are the Van Allen radiation belts located thousands of miles above the Earth's surface. Oh, let me this so you can read it a little bit better though it's in your book still this will be a little bit better um, and by the way who is Van Allen anyway and that wasn't first name Van second name Allen Van Allen I think was his last name pretty sure on that radiation belts uh, you could write on him you know uh, now he's more of a physicist than a mathematician but I bet you you can run into some math on that too uh, and then, how are they described? How is calculus used to talk about it? Located thousands of miles above the Earth's surface, are made up of streams of protons and electrons that oscillate back and forth in helical paths uh, between two magnetic mirrors set up by the Earth's magnetic field. That helical motion is explained by the cross product nature of the forces. Now, why they put uh, the magnetic forces down on the next line, I'm not sure. Okay? But again, a cross product is involved here. Now, when I look at this picture, nothing is too completely clear. They have 
some blue belts here and some purple belts there. Are those both Van Allen belts? Or just one of them? Or, or the other? Or is the yard that uh, And I think they do have multiple belts. So I think this is the innermost and that's the outer one. So I think we fit into lock that. They should all indicate it here. Now, I think I'm pretty sure that's different from the ionosphere. Okay? The ionosphere is also uh, a sphere around the Earth in our Earth's atmosphere that is made up mostly of charged ions. That's what they call ionosphere. Now, I just can't remember which, but when the space shuttle or any spacecraft is coming or going, when they pass through it, either the Van Allen belts or the ionosphere, I don't remember which it is, and maybe they're linked together somehow, you basically lose communication with them for a while. Because all that ion activity going on then blocks the radio transmission and makes it very difficult to hear. Hear. Now, the reason I remember that fairly vividly, and I hope I got it right, I just don't remember which is what it is. Um, do you remember when the, I'm trying to remember which one it was, I think it was Challenger uh, space shuttle. It blew up in space. One of them blew up just off the lost path. I think that was Columbia, wasn't it? And Challenger blew up when it was coming back in after a successful trip. The heat shields, they had lost some heat shields, and it was enough that the wings, the aluminum melted because it got too much heat. And I, I'm pretty sure, I, I hope I'm remembering this right, they thought they were having trouble, and because they had received some sort of stressful type thing or something or another, but then they entered the Van Al the whichever it was, ionosphere or Van Allen's belt, and they lost communications, and then they never got them back. And, you know, people, and they thought they knew what the problem was, but hoped that somehow they made it, but they lost communications, and but I think they actually disintegrated somewhere in there. Had nothing to do with the ions. It's just that on re-entry, they were getting very hot because some of the shields, uh, tiles had broken off during launch. And going up, they weren't going fast enough for it to be a problem, but coming back, they were. And since the, those weren't there to deflect the heat, then the inside got really hot. The aluminum that made the frame melted, and it just basically fell apart. Pretty sad situation. But I think that coincided with entering that area that they lost communication. I think they were hearing the stress type things, you know, the temperature going up, you know, but, you know, but then they lost communication because of that, but they didn't know, did we lose them or did we just lose communication? They waited and waited and surely ought to be out of that now. Never heard back from them. So that's, I hope I didn't make that up three minutes or something, but it seems like I heard that was going. I happened to be up in Huntsville at the time, which is pretty space oriented. Uh, a niece of ours was swimming in a swim meet, so we were up there for that. And my wife's parents and her sister's family live up there, so her dad worked for NASA and her mom worked for the Arsenal there. So anyway, besides the point. All right, so we're talking about cross products. Now, unlike the dot product, which is V dot W, scalar quantity, a cross product is, again, a vector, becomes a vector, not a scalar. It is defined, I really don't like the way they say that, defined using determinants, okay? Yeah, that's sort of true, but I wouldn't say it's defined that. You use determinants to, to calculate it. Uh, which we define in a 2x2 two two and then 3x3 three three cases. A 2x2 two two determinant is a number 
form from the array of numbers with two rows and two columns. Now, I know, Emmanuel, we just touched on determinants in linear algebra. And I can't remember, have you ever had determinants? Okay. I didn't think you would have. So let's talk about that for a little bit. First, you know what a matrix is. It's an array of numbers. And you could have a 7 by 8 array of numbers, a 2 by 15 array of numbers, a 1 by by something, yeah, you know, a column vector, uh, okay. But when we're talking about determinants, you better be talking about square matrices. So we're going to restrict ourselves to either two by two or three by three, okay, matrices, okay. This is an example. Let me go on and erase this off. That was the stuff we were doing before. And just for now, zoom in on this. Now, this array of numbers is what we call a matrix, two by two matrix. Most of the time that would be embraced in brackets, okay, indicating it's a, a matrix. That's all the brackets would do, square brackets. But when they put the vertical bars around that, that's not just talking about the matrix, it's talking about the determinant. Of that matrix. The determinant of a 2 by 2 is a pretty easy thing. It's AB minus BC, just like they say here. You do the main diagonal, the product of the main diagonal, minus the product of the other diagonal. Okay? That's the, the determinant. Now, in linear algebra, we use the determinant so far. We're going to do a whole chapter on them later. But we, so far, we use that just to tell, to, to tell whether the matrix is invertible or not, which we don't need to do. But how we did that, that was saying, if this determinant, which is that product minus that product, if that is zero, this is not an invertible matrix. If it's anything other than zero, positive, negative, big, small, fractions, decimals, doesn't matter, Anything other than zero it is an invertible matrix. Okay, we're not concerned with that here, necessarily. We're not inverting the matrix or anything else. But that's where you may have hit it sometime in your past life or otherwise or some life. Okay, that's what a determinant is. Now, it's the difference of the diagonal products. So let's do a few of those because they're so much fun, aren't they? Okay. Let's do the determinant of 3, 2, 1 half, 4. That's worse than most of the ones we see in linear algebra, isn't it? What would that be? Three times four is twelve minus Y, which would be 11. Okay? That's the determinant of that matrix. Okay? Now, how could we do a 3 by 3? Okay? Well, Emmanuel's jumping the gun here. He's going to learn this before we do it in linear algebra. Here's what we do with this. Now, there's many ways to do it, but to be consistent with it. Now, what they have chosen is to use the top row. You didn't have to choose the top row. You could have chosen any row, or you could have chosen any column. But once you should have chosen it, here's what you do. Take this first element here, A1, then wipe out the, that first row and first column, and then do the determinant of what's left. Okay? DC, and you take that and multiply it by the determinant of DCC3 minus DCD3. And that's called the 1, 1 minus, by the way, if you needed to have a name for it. Now, here's the trick. When you have the larger matrices like this, the 2 by 2, you just do it. Okay? When you have larger matrices 
be you basically, and this is what I call it, you assign a sign that sounds like I'm being repetitive to each position. And it doesn't really matter how you go, you just go some regular pattern. Plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. Or plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. They always turn out the same as long as you follow those patterns. Just don't do anything on the diagonal. Plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, yeah. However you do it, you're going to get the same result. Okay? So, for the second, if you chose to use this row, that second entry is a negative entry. So, minus B1, that's where that came from. And then you wipe out the second column in the first row. And the, the minor, the 1, 2 minor, which is A2, 3, A2, B3, minus B2, A3. Okay? Then you go to the third element, which is a plus position. Plus C1, times wipe out that uh, row and, and column. And that's a 1, 3 minor, A2, 1, A2, B3, minus B2, A3. So that would be your return of a 3, 1, 3. Okay. That's matrix finding the determinant. 2 by 2 and 3 by 3 matrix. What are we doing here? We're supposed to be finding a cross product. What has this got to do with the cross product? Well, we're going to use the way that you do a determinant and, and do that. Now, notice the book just said, use the top row. I said to find the determinant of the matrix, you can use any row in each column. Sort of forget that for what we're going to do, because what we're going to do is assign the top row a very special representation. And then the next two rows will take on their own meaning. Okay? So, before we do that, though, we're going to uh, they're going to have us play with determinants. I thought they were going to pass these, but they're not. Example 1 is actually going to be finding a determinant, even though we'll not necessarily do determinants in this course except this one particular way. But let's do example one. I don't think I've got a slide on it. So let's, I'm sorry, let's do example one. Calculate the determinant of two, four, three, zero, one, negative seven, Negative 1, 5, 3. Okay. Now we're going to do it the way the book said, even though there is an easier way. Okay. We're going to do the top row. Because in the future, that's all we're going to do for cross product. For a very special reason. But, if this were really matrix algebra, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I would do it the easy way. But we do it their way. You tell me what to write down. 2 times the determinant of 1, negative 7, 5, 3, minus 4 times the determinant of 0, negative 7, negative 1, 3, plus 3, times the determinant of 0, 1, negative 1, 5. Got it. Now, calculate the determinant. That's 2 times 2nd. Uh, I heard did you say positive 38? Yeah, 38. My hearing's bad. You see how I got that? 1 times 3 is 3, minus the product of negative 5 times 7, that would be negative 35, but you're subtracting it, so that's plus 35, so 3 plus 35 is 38. Next, minus 4 times 
a little louder. Uh, 3 times 0 is 0. Minus Sega. Okay, negative 7. Got it. Okay, I can't hear. Plus 3 times Help me out with that one. Easiest one. What? Okay. Now let's do this. That will be 76, I hope, plus 28, plus 3, and that's equal to, what is that? 79 and 28, that would be 80 and 27, that's 107. I hope, I hope, yes, that's right. Okay. Now, that was for fun. We're really not going to care about determinants of 3 by 3 matrices. This is just to show you how it's done. Okay? Here's what we do care about. We care about how we use this process of taking a determinant to determine your cross product. And here's what we use it for. Here's the definition of the cross product. Okay. The cross product of two three-dimensional vectors. <clears throat> okay? Now, you almost have to have three-dimensional vectors. Because remember, the cross space is going to be just dealing with the, the third dimension. You have two vectors, and then the cross product is always perpendicular to both of the others. So you can't stay in two space and have a cross product. You have to be in three space. So we'll have three dimensional vectors. Here's vector D, which is A1, B1, C1. I always prefer to call it B1, B2, and B3, but this is fine. Okay. A1, B1, C1. And some other vector W, which is A2, B2, C2. Okay? Now, the cross product of those vectors, here's how you get it. V cross W. And folks, right now, the order matters on cross products. Dot products, it doesn't really matter. It matters on cross products. Dot products are commutative, cross products are not. Okay? Now, so here's how you find V cross W. You put the determinant, and this has got a 3 by 3 matrix here, but the first row of that matrix is always. The unit vector is I, J, and M. Unit vector is the first component direction. Unit vector is the second component direction. Unit vector is the third component direction. Okay? And then you put those components in order. The second row is the B, A1, B1, C1. And the third row is the W, A2, B2, C2, C2. Those three components. Under their unit vector. Now you do the determinant, okay? But, and this is why we only use the top row, okay? If we were doing that other, the determinant of a regular three-dimensional, um, uh, three-by-three matrix, we could have chosen any row, any top. That's why the book only showed us how to do the top row, because we need to have the top row. So rather than leading with that, we're going to follow them, because that's going to be the vector point. So you do the cross product of B1, C2, minus C1, B2, and that's going to give you your coefficient for your i vector. So the J, remember that's the negative position, so you do negative before you do this, B1 times C, A1 times C2 minus C1 times A2, J, plus, because that's the plus position, A1, B1 minus A2, C1, K. Okay? You just do it to see here. And these are simple little 3 by 2. You can calculate the coefficient, the I vector, the J vector, and the K vector. Now, if you wanted to go back and write this in component form, 
you just put angle bracket, whatever that number was, comma, this number with the minus, and this number, and close the angle bracket. You don't have to use IJK notation. All you do is drop them and put it in brackets. The comments are coming. Okay, does that make sense? Now, have any of you had Dr. Bryant for physics? I think you have, don't you? Have you done some cross products yet there? He probably showed you a slightly different way. Gives you the same result, but I like this way better too because sometimes I forget about that minus sign. Okay? So here is the slightly different way. Okay? Um, but before I do that, I'm going to write down what this answer is. It's B1, C2, minus, it doesn't matter which way you do it, C1, B2, I, minus A1, C2, minus C1, A2, J, plus A1, B2, minus B1, A2, K. Now, I may not have been consistent on how I did that order, but whatever. That's your answer. Now I'm going to show you the other way. I like this one just a little bit better. It's a little more work up front, but it, to me it makes it so much easier on the back end. Okay? Let's set it up the same way we did before. I, I can't write I even, okay? Okay. I, J, K. A1, B1, C1, A2, C2. <laughs> B2, C2. Uh, now, one thing I neglected, I don't want that line there. I'm going to expand this matrix, sort of, a little bit. You could think of it as augmenting if you wanted to, but it's just basically an artificial expansion. What I'm going to do is repeat the first two columns. I, A1, A2, J, B1, B2. Now, most of the time we don't take determinants of rectangular, but we're not really. We're just doing this process, okay? And here's what it is. Do the diagonal this way. Those are always positive. That would be B1, C2, I, plus C1, A2, J, plus um, A1, B2, K, minus, if they're going the other way, it's minus, B1, A2, K, minus C1, B2, I, minus A1, C2, J. Okay? Now, what I'm going to do is combine like vectors. Okay, is that okay? Well, a good way to say it. Let's combine my eyes. There they are. And that would be B1, C2, minus C1, B2, I. Look at that. Same thing we had here. Let's do the J's. Now, let me rewrite the J's up here as minus A1, C2, plus C1, 
A2, right? If you distribute that minus sign inside, and then if you put the plus in front, it would be plus C1A2 minus A1C2J. So let's do these, the J's here, plus C1A2 minus A1C2J. Same thing as we got here with a little bit of alteration, but we didn't do anything wrong. And then when you combine these two, you get plus A1B1 minus B1. A1B2 minus B1A2, K, which is exactly what we got here. So, this way you have to split it into three different two by two matrices, remembering the sign, doing the calculation. This way you can expand it, just multiply. Positive diagonal is going downward, negative diagonal is going up. Now, all we need is three. Don't try to do a two or anything like that. Only need three. To me, that's a little easy. I don't have to worry about the sign. I don't have to worry about forgetting the sign. It's really easy to remember. Going uphill to a downhill slope is going to be your the positives, and a uphill slope is going to be negative. So, yeah. Going downhill, I like. One up till I don't. That's not okay. Whatever. Okay. So I thought I'd show you both ways. You can use the books way or this way. All right. Let's clear this out of the way then. You okay with it? Any questions? Okay. Let's do example two. Calculate V cross W. And that's what we call it. Rather than time sign, like we used to use in, in math, we use dot or cross, and you use those terms, dot or cross, V dot W, V cross W. So calculate V cross W where V, vector V, is this vector here, negative 2, 1, 4. And W is this vector 3, 2, 5. Okay? How would you find the cross product? Second? Yes, exactly. Act like you're taking a determinant of a matrix and write I, J, K. Now, do you want to do it the second way I showed you or the first way the book did? You want to do it the way the book did? Oh, boo, yes. Okay. We'll do it that way. Okay. And then what do we write under that? Negative 2, 1, 4, and 3, 2, 5. Okay, so to do this, now tell me if this is bad. If it is, I won't do it, okay? I know I'm going to have my I here, okay? And I know the determinant of these is going to be what is the coefficient of the I. So let's just do it. Five, no, uh, you're multiplying, five minus Eight would be five minus eight, negative three i. Done. Okay. Now I'm going to take my little scratch off of there because ooh, I thought I was going to take it off of there. Okay. Because it's going to get messy if I leave it in there too long. Okay. Now let's do the J's. Now the J's we're going to cross out that row in the column and do what's left. But remember, now this is where you have to remember, it's a negative quantity, okay? So it's going to be minus and do the cross here. Negative 10 minus 12 
negative 22, right? Minus 22J. Because you use that symbol there. Okay. I'm going to take off my, what do they call those, construction lines, you know, if you're doing drafting. Okay. Now let's do the K. So wipe out the third row, but the first first row, third column, and do that determinant. That's going to be a plus, because this is a plus one. And that will be negative 4. Minus 3 would be negative 7K, if I could write. Okay? So, this gives us a, the cross product, this cross product is minus 3i plus 22j minus 7k. Now, if you wanted to write it in component form, just drop the i, j's, k, and write it as negative 3, comma, 22, comma, negative 7. Either way. It's fine. Okay, that's how we did it. Let's see what they got. Negative 3i minus 12. They kept the minus or minus, you know, for a while too long. They wrote, though, the final factor is negative 3, 22, negative 7. Perfect. Now, if you didn't want to do it that way, you could have expanded and copied the first two columns after the k column uh, in that order. Then go to the diagonal rather than having to do three different cross products. Whichever you want to do is fine. Okay. That was example two. Now, this is what the book calls Formula Three. Okay. It used to be a race car. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Formula 3 gives no hint of the geometric meaning of the cross product. All it does is gives you the numbers and the vectors, okay? But it has no geometric meaning of the cross product. However, there is a simple way to visualize the cross product of two vectors. And that's using the right-hand rule. We've hit that before. Here we hit it again. Suppose that V... W and U are non-zero vectors, thank you very much, that do not all lie in the same plane. Any two of them will be in the same plane, but the third one, uh, no matter how you split them up, will be in a different plane. Okay. We say that V, W, U forms a right-handed system if the direction of U <clears throat> it's determined by the right-hand rule. Okay, and here's what it is. Let's say this one. V cross W, we're going to say, is the vector U. So if V is somewhere up that way, point your fingers in the direction of V. Now if U is somewhere that way, point those fingers, keeping it pointed that way, then bend them at 90 degrees, or whatever it takes to point toward W. Okay? Whatever angle that would be. So wherever that is that W is, then your right thumb is pointing in the positive direction for what do we call it? U or whatever it is. That would be the direction of U. So whatever. V was heading down that way. And W was that way. So you would be heading in that way. Here you use your right hand wherever V is, you know, and then W is, your, your cross product is going to be perpendicular to both of those. Okay. Now notice V and W don't have to be 90 degrees, but they do cross them in the acute angle or the right angle. No, let's see. No. Acute right or obtuse. But don't, don't have them going in the opposite direction. Don't do the negative, okay? But get the, the angle less than 180 degrees or, or pi and point them in those directions 
and then that will give you the right thumb will give you the direction of you. Okay. Now, I'm going to point this out to Emmanuel mostly. Y'all can listen to. Uh, we say that VWU, that collection of those three vectors, forms a right-handed system if the direction of U is determined by the right-hand rule that's when your fingers of your right hand curl from B to U, your thumb points in the same plane as saturated by V, as span by, that's the whole word I was going for, span by V and W, V and W, as U, okay? Uh, that concept of spanning, is something that Emmanuel you'll run into in linear algebra. We aren't there yet, but you will. Now, you have, yeah, you're in linear algebra. I keep forgetting which two classes each of you are in. Okay. But the two of you will run into spanning again. Unless you take linear algebra or take it somewhere else, you probably won't see the word spanning anymore. But in other words, two vectors, especially in free space, two vectors define a plane. We otherwise say it spans a plane, and then the plane perpendicular to that is is the the, the a vector perpendicular to that plane is going to be that. Okay. Now here's the I think it would be the following. Oh, there's our right hand rule there. V and W in that direction. Okay. That's V cross W. Okay. Um they have two figures like that in the our text. They only show the one here, I think, unless they show it later. So let's talk about this theorem one. Goodness gracious. Mind me when. Uh, Marcus comes back. Uh, he wants to remind everybody about the. Uh... No, I did. I said it. Did I tell you about hidden figures at the beginning of class? Okay, but with Marcus, yeah. Oh, were you? Uh, all I did at the beginning was say you've heard all the announcements because Emmanuel was the only one here, and he had already heard it this morning. But did I tell you about it today? Monday. One little difference there, but let me wait until Marcus comes back in case he missed it this morning. Okay? Because uh, I think he came in late this morning, too. I can't remember. But anyway. Okay. So here's theorem one. The geometric description of the cross product. The cross product of V cross U. V is some vector. W, uh, v cross W. And W is some vector. They have some relationship somehow here, okay? Now, V cross W would then be whatever direction V is in, and if W, if V is this way and W is back this way, then turn your right hand so V's here and turn it toward W, okay? Then the cross product is pointing down, okay? Whatever it is, but don't do V cross W because that will point in the wrong direction. Get it here. Okay, the cross product V cross W is the unique vector, there's one and only one of them, with the following three properties, all three properties. Number one, V cross W is got to be orthogonal both to V and the W. V and W don't have to be orthogonal to each other, but they can't be collinear. Okay? If they were collinear, then the cross product would be zero. Okay? So they're orthogonal. Uh, v cross W is orthogonal to both V and W. V cross W, now this is U. It has a length. Now notice the similarity to what we had with dot product. We had V dot W 
That was defined as magnitude of V times magnitude of W times the cosine of the angle in between. Well, that was a scalar quantity called all of these three things would have been scalar. But now we're talking about the length, which is a scalar quantity. This tells you its direction. This tells you its length. V cross W is the magnitude of V, the, the length of magnitude of V, times the magnitude of W, times the sine of the angle in between. Okay? But keep the angle between 0 and pi. Okay? Don't try to do that kind of a cross. If this is V and this is W, put your fingers here and go to the less than 90 degree, or less than 180 degree angle that connects the two, then it's going down that way. Okay? So that's the link. Magnitude of V, magnitude of W has the sine of the angle, so make sure that angle is between 0 and pi. Now, between 0 and pi, what can you tell me about the sine? Always positive. So this indeed is a link. Magnitude of V is a uh, positive quantity. Magnitude of W is a positive quantity. Positive quantity. And sine of theta, as long as you keep theta between 0 and pi, that's a positive quantity. So you cannot have a negative link here. It will never happen. Now, turn the set of V, W, and V cross W forms a right hand distance. Okay, so V and W are in one plane, and V cross W is in the plane perpendicular to that, in the direction of the right thumb, and we call it V and W. Okay, make sense? Now, I think we're ready for example three. Now, here's that, okay. This looks almost just like this one, okay? Now, the only difference is the next one I'm going to show defines that as the angle theta, and it also shows that this would be negative, okay? Which basically hardly makes it worth. So this is V, W, U forming a right-hand system. This is two vectors. There are two vectors orthogonal to V and W with that same length, V magnitude and V magnitude and W times sine of theta. The right hand rule determines which is V cross U, which is the one in the direction of the right thumb. So you call V is W. If W is this were V and that were W, then it would be the exact opposite of W. Okay? The, what we're, now it would be minus U would be positive. Any questions on that? Okay. Now. I don't think. Uh, I'm going too far here before I do that. This doesn't line up too well. Okay. The direction of U, I've written over and over again, V cross W is determined by the right hand rule. So this time they drew V I don't see W here to you. Yeah, they left it off, didn't they? W is over here somewhere, okay? Uh, I guess it's behind that symbol and I can't move it. So what they did, they took the symbol for four and put it on top of the figure the equation form put it on top of figure 5. So the W, which you can't see, is somewhere here. Yeah, there's the component problem. 0 on X, 1 on Y, and 1 on Z. So it's coming up here in the X, Y, Z plane, uh, up here like this. Okay? You just 
get here. So if you do v cos u, then sure enough, that will point up. And v cos w, u is pointing up in that direction. So if you get it the other way, w cos v, then that would be w this way, v this way, then you would be pointing exactly the opposite way. So they're showing this, which is minus that. They're written here, this, which is minus that. So this is a little wacko. They put two different things on top of each other and obscured everything. All right. But that's beyond where we need to be. So let's where it's going to be the best place to write. Ah, here we go. Let's write here. Let's do example three. This is the thing that was on top of figure five, which messed it up. Okay? So let's do example three, which actually came before this. Here we have let and man. Ha! Huh. Let's go back. This is figure, this is example three. Okay? Sorry about that. Here is V, and this vector is 2, 0, 0. And vector W is 0, 1, 1. Now you can't see it in this figure because this little block that on the next slide, but it's supposed to be on this slide too. Whoever the graphics person was sort of botched it up. Okay? Okay. So, there we have the two vectors. I'll let you look at them in the plane. Of course, 2, 0, 0 comes out the x axis. And by the way, the x, y, z coordinate system has to be right hand. That's where we had it before. And sure enough, it is. So, the vector v is just out the x axis, nowhere on y. Nowhere on the just out the x axis to you. Whereas the vector w is not coming out the x axis at all. It's, so it's in the y z plane and it's one unit on y and one unit up on z, but exactly perpendicular to the uh, x z. The x axis would be somewhere in the y z plane. So if you're doing set up. Determine U which is V cross W. Okay. Um, it says using the geometric properties of the cross product rather than equation 3. I blew this. I like equation 3. So it says, using the geometric properties. What two ge geometric properties do we know about V cross W? Uh, what does every vector have? Two quantities. Vector has two quantities. What are they? Okay, a scalar has one quantity, meaning a value, right? Magnitude and direction, of course. If we know magnitude and direction, we know the vector u, right? So, which you want to do first? Magnitude or direction? Magnitude? I like that too. So, let's determine the magnitude of that cross product. So, I'm going to write it this way. Magnitude of the cross product is what? Help me out here. Magnitude of V times the magnitude of W, if I can get my pen to write. Times what? Uh, 
second sine of the angle theta. Okay? Now, wait a minute, folks. Do we even know what theta is? Any of you have an idea? I gave it away a minute ago. I said if we was along the x-axis and does it was going to be y z tangent. So what's the angle between those two? 90 degrees. Let's say the x-axis is that axis and this is the y z plane here. That's 90 degrees from each other, right? So we know that. Anyone happen to know what the sine of 90 degrees is? Second? One. Exactly. Because that's the definition for the magnitude of a cross product. Let's go back. No. No. Where was it? I skipped all. Oh, there it is. Right here. The cross product has a length, the magnitude of we just determined the angle in between is 90, so the sine of 90 is 1. So basically, it's the product of the magnitudes of the two vectors. So what is the magnitude of V? Okay, pull out your calculators. What is that? Please tell me you don't need a calculator. It was a joke. What is the magnitude of V? Two units on the x-axis is two units long, right? Now, magnitude of W is maybe just a little harder, but not too bad. What is that? The square root of two, okay? One squared plus one squared is two. One plus one is two. Ah, high level math today. And then take the square root of that, square root of two. So there is the magnitude of U. It is two root two. All we need is direction of this cross product. Okay? Now, um, Okay, let's think about this. There's your x. Uh, here was your y. B, here's your w. W is 1, 1 this way. So this, this, cross that is going to be somewhere back that way, right? It has to be perpendicular to each of these. Okay? Now, uh, Okay, now, um, I'm having a little bit of a problem following why they say you W is in, oh, okay, I'm misreading, okay. Somebody misread here. No, 
Got it. They've got something wrong here, I think. Here's my problem. Uh, I'm sorry, we're running out of time. Not yet. Um, w is in the YZ plane. Okay, they gave us that. And then down here at the bottom, it says, finally, property 3 tells us that U points in the positive Z direction. Thus, B is equal to negative 2. And you would be 0, negative 2, 2, which is in the YZ plane. And it's got to be perpendicular. Wait, 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 wait. It's got to be perpendicular to both V and W. They've got something wrong here. I think what they mean is the XZ plane. No? Can't be the XZ plane either, because that wouldn't be perpendicular to 2. Okay. Oh, no, got it, got it, got it. It is in the YZ plane. Okay, got it. Okay. Because it's got to be perpendicular to V, and that places it in the XYZ plane. W is already in the YZ plane, so it has to be perpendicular to W. But in uh, in this point, so basically, yeah, so, yeah, they said it right. Uh, it's in the X V plane. I just when it said in the positive Z direction, I said no, it's not. It's at an angle to that. But they meant positive Z as opposed to negative Z direction in the X V plane. Okay, so it's got to be going over here. So it's got to be perpendicular. That with that magnitude. All right. So, uh, so you see the y value has to be negative, the z value positive. So the cross product is going to be something, it can't be anything in the x direction because it has to be perpendicular to x. So it's going to be 0, and then I guess that's what they're saying, B, C. I don't know if they use those terms or not, okay? Now, two things about it. Certainly, if you did the dot product, let's call this U, okay? Dot product between those two that automatically comes up being 0, right? 0 times 2, 0 times B, Z, okay. Dot product between these two has to be zero as well, okay? And one other condition here, so we know that B plus C is equal to zero because when you do the dot product of those two, that's zero plus B plus C. So B plus C is zero, okay? Now the other thing we know <clears throat> is the square root of b squared plus c squared is equal to 2 root 2. Right? Because that's the magnitude of it. Right? Okay. Now, let's square both sides. That would be b squared plus c squared is equal to 8. Square of 2 and you get 4. Square root, root 2 you get 2. 4 times 2 is 8. All right. Now, 
This tells us that B is equal to negative C. Okay? So plugging that in here, you get B squared plus, well, let's do it the other way, negative C squared. Let me Eraser key isn't picking up well. Okay. Negative C squared plus C squared. I don't need but one of them. Is equal to 8. Okay, well this would be C squared plus C squared is equal to 8. So this is 2C squared is equal to 8. So C squared is equal to 4. And C is equal to either plus or minus 2. But we've already said that the C, which is the Z direction, has to be positive. That's what they were saying. Has to be in the upward direction because of the right-hand rule. So that makes C positive 2, B is equal to negative 2. So then your U vector is 0, negative 2, Okay, <laughs> I say to and write C. I don't know where that came from. Okay, so that's what they were doing. Zero, negative two, two. All right. So they did get it right. All right. It's basically when you get that far, then you have to use solve two equations, and it's much easier to use a substitution than to, uh, than to do try to do anything else. You use the right hand rule to tell you which one is which one. I was figuring out why they said in the positive z direction. I thought they meant up the z axis, but I see what they mean. Okay, we are right out of time, so we'll begin next time on this slide right here, which is something we've already said, but we'll emphasize it again. So, homework exercises here include. Seems like times do by the day. Any of the uh, either one or three, five or seven. Any of the uh, no either nine or eleven. I guess we stop there, but we did do some in twelve three too. So we'll stop there. And uh, we'll pick up and go from there next time. So we'll start on. Good deal. We'll hopefully make more progress next time. Sorry about that. Okay.